look like a church. A church where everyone is accepted. Where you will grow in your faith journey. A place where you'll find friends and support and where you definitely are valued. We hope to see you here at Long Riders Clubhouse, Pacific Highway, Heatherbrae. First Sunday of every month, you will be blessed, encouraged and inspired. See you there. Hey guys, on this week's uh, episode of Biker Church, you're going to be so blessed. We've got Rachel from Destiny Rescue, an, an incredible ministry that you're going to hear about uh, releasing young women and young men from sex slavery please be aware that some of this content is pretty um yeah it's pretty heavy going so if you need to pause at any time or take a breather but don't stop watching because you will be blessed and challenged and i hope that you'll um go to the website we'll have it on the screen a few times destinyrescue.org.au and find out how you can be part of this dynamic life transforming ministry so be blessed She couldn't wait to come up here and hang out at the clubhouse with us all. And it's true. I know she was looking forward to the motorcycle pulpit. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's and, uh, so great. But it's just really good to have her here. And um, why don't you come up, Rachel? Give her a great welcome to the Long Riders this morning. is now the fastest growing criminal activity globally. It has superseded the sale of drugs. It has superseded the sale of arms. We are selling more of each other now than what we ever have in the history of humanity. And like, you know, people say to me, oh yeah, but you know, William Wilberforce, William Wilberforce we all know was a man who stood up against trafficking, but, and he was an incredible Christian man who fought very hard for many years to make the trafficking of humans illegal. But people say, oh yeah, population, you know, the population was way smaller. Even if 
you do that, you, you make, create those statistics per head of population, we are still trafficking more humans now than what we ever have in the history of humanity. The value of a human life is at an all-time low. Children are being sold in countries for less than what we pay for a bottle of beer. Now, I don't know about you, but I think God, that breaks God's heart. Because the God that I know is all about life. The God that I know is all about freedom. The God that I know is all about hope. The God that I know is all about making sure kids are safe. And he said that in the Gospels. He said, if you hurt one of these children, it would be better if some serious stuff would happen if you hurt a kid. In Isaiah 61, God says these words, The Spirit of God, the Master, and I'm reading from the Message Translation, The Spirit of God, the Master, is on me because God anointed me, that's you and I, to preach good news to the poor. Poverty is one of the greatest sources of human trafficking globally. Desperation causes trafficking to escalate. Sadly, because of COVID, we are now seeing the trafficking of humanity increase at exponential rates. He sent me to preach good news to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, announce freedom to all captives, pardon all prisoners. God sent me to announce the year of his grace, a celebration of God's destruction of our enemies and to comfort all who mourn. I think this scripture is very clear about God's mandate for us on the planet. We have the ability, we have the power, we have the means to be able to bring life and healing in some of the darkest places on the planet. Destiny Rescue was founded in Australia. Destiny Rescue was founded by an Australian man, but actually he was a Kiwi, I have to tell you. If you can't tell, I am a Kiwi and proud. Hey, we couldn't tell. Oops, I'm losing everything here. Couldn't tell. Is that why you talk funny? That's exactly why I talk funny. A Kiwi and proud. All black support always, of course. No. <laughs> Are you I sure? I wouldn't even try, you'd just laugh. Yeah, 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 Can you yeah, imagine yeah, this Palangi yeah. person doing the haka? <laughs> I have had, mind you, I must tell you, can I tell you a little story? When we left, my husband and I were ministers in New Zealand, and uh, we were part of quite a large church in New Zealand, and we had a very, very multicultural church that we passed because we loved. And when we left, we were in this huge auditorium of about 5,000 people, and uh, we had these, all of a sudden, down the back of the hall, like about 30 or 40 um, men from so many different Pacific Island and, Mo and from the New Zealand, Māori, you know, indigenous people. And they all just came in and stood down the back and then they all just started coming towards the front and started doing a haka in front of us. <laughs> I tell you, part of me was freaked out. <laughs> and the other part of me was just crying. And actually, when you, when someone does a haka for you, as a friend, it's a totally different meaning. Like, it's not like when we stand in front of the wallabies. <laughs> totally different. <laughs> so when a group of Māori or Pacific Island people come and haka as your friend, what that means is this, is um, you will have our blessing and protection from this generation to the next to the next and forever. And so about 50 men just did this haka to say, no one touches you. If they do, we come for them. A bit like that. <laughs> so, right now, one million children that we know of are trapped in slavery and exploitation. 99% of children globally are girls that are trapped in exploitation. And this statistic here is really confronting. 73% are in Asia and in the Pacific. They are not thousands or, you know, right across in other continents, they are right on our doorstep. This industry makes, we think, or we know it's more, $99 billion per year. So if you want to put that into context, the on-selling of humanity and the on-selling of children makes more than what Nike makes, makes more than what Disney makes, it makes more than what Pixar creates, it makes every year. It is a highly lucrative, but a highly destructive industry. Next slide there, Matt. But we believe, but our strategic purpose at Destiny Rescue is to rescue and help survivors stay free. 
Next slide, Matt. So night and day, literally, the teams at Destiny Rescue search for these kids. The nations that we're looking in, we're working in, we have seven project nations and we have many undisclosed nations that we can't talk about. We can't tell you where we're working always. But we are relentlessly looking for these children, day and night. We have agents, highly trained agents, who work in some of the darkest places on the planet. There is nothing darker, I can tell you, than where we find these children. And our agents go into these places and they relentlessly try to find these children. And we believe when we go, we are fulfilling Psalms. 82 verse 3 to 4 in the, in the Passion Translation, it says this, we defend the defenseless. These children have no voice. They have no ability to get out. They are just waiting for someone to find them. We defend the defenseless. We are the, the fatherless and the forgotten. We liberate them from the grasp of the wicked. That is the mission of Destiny Rescue. Next slide there. Yeah. Oh, you're, you're ahead of me now. I'm trying to <laughs> so you, we were based in Australia. We are an internationally recognized not-for-profit. We are called upon by MI6. We are called upon by the FBI. We are called upon by AFP to do work in different countries across the world. We are faith-based. We are a Christian organization. We believe God has asked us to fulfill Isaiah 61 in our lifetime. I believe God has asked me to help fill Isaiah 61 in this context in my lifetime. And if I get a bit emotional, please forgive me, because I take this as a sacred calling from God to be able to fulfill this mandate in my lifetime. As I said, we operate in Thailand, Cambodia, the Philippines, Nepal, the Dominican Republic, and now we are operating in four, nearly five undisclosed nations. Our funding comes from Australia, New Zealand, and the USA, and we work alongside law enforcement agencies. We are not vigilantes. We are highly strategic and we work to strategies and plans in conjunction with the legal authorities of the countries that we work in. What the advantages of this is, we get to bring justice. So what that means is we get to see the people who are propagating this crime imprisoned. This week, we rescued 11 girls out of a ring and we were able to arrest two pimps and they are now in the legal system in the Philippines. So our highly tra trained agents go to the darkest places on the planet in search of children trapped in trafficking and exploitation. Once these children are found, our priority is to bring them to freedom. There are different types of rescues we do. The first one is a covert rescue. We have two agents. Now our agents, I would say, are some of the bravest people on the planet. They truly are our heroes. And you know, they're just incredible. Incredible guys, incredible women that go into these places. They go undercover. These covert rescues are rescues where we go into the places that you and I wouldn't even want to be found in, to be honest. They're not great places. And we look for the kids. We start to do surveillance. We start to use equipment. We use equipment that identifies perpetrators and ensures that we are able to uplift the children firstly safely and then able to outwork some really key relationships with legal authorities in that country and bring justice. The second type of rescue that we do is a raid. Now a raid is where a team of agents will have done all the preparation work, they would have done all the intelligence, all the intel, and then what we do is we work with local authorities and we're able to go in and rescue children en masse. The largest raid that we have done in the last couple of years was the largest raid in the history of the Philippines in trafficking. So City Rescue was able to do all the surveillance work, all the behind the scenes work, gather all the intel, and we were able to, um, we brought on board the Philippine SAS, and we were able to go into this place and literally uplift and rescue 72 women and children who had been trapped and exploited for I don't know how long. It was absolutely incredible. If you want to watch a documentary on that, go to our website, destinyrescue.org.au, and you can watch the whole story. It's a pretty amazing story. But friends, I want to reassure you, we're not just doing this because it's a nice idea. We're doing this because we believe in Isaiah 61. And I know you guys do too. We also have border rescues. We work in Nepal, and we are staying
legalisation not all across right along the Nepalese border as much as we can be, and we stop the trafficking of children through Nepal into an undisclosed nation. I can't tell you what that nation is, but we stop the children being exploited into those na that nation. Once a child arrives in that nation, we've found children from Nepal in Uganda. We've found children from Nepal in different parts of the world. It's a hub and they get trafficked on. So we're very passionate about border rescues in, in, in Nepal. And we have female agents that work relentlessly on those borders to help us find these kids. Interventional rescues are rescues that focus in on child marriage and completely and utterly and totally opposed to this practice around the world. Child marriage has now been classified by the United Nations as trafficking and we are really committed to rescuing young women out of that, those situations, child marriage. And uh, friends, this happens in our country as well. This happens in Australia, it happens in New Zealand. And we are really wanting to be a voice in this space to vindicate and advocate for women and young girls across the world. Generational rescues, a rescue where trafficking is a practice that has been passed on through the generations. And we also want to be involved, and we are involved in preemptive rescues. So we rescue children before and young women before they are trafficked. There is hope. <laughs> I know this is intense, but I want to tell you there's some amazing stories that I could talk to you about young women who are able, we rescue, and then we put them on what we call, and this is the this is what I, I'm so I love, and I think it's just so incredible what we call our pathway to freedom. We're all on a pathway to freedom, right? So we're very passionate about getting these kids out, getting these young women out, and putting them on a pathway to freedom. But this pathway to freedom is absolutely phenomenal. What we do is we put children where we can back with their families, and we work with their families and help them negotiate a new life for themselves. And I, like, I'm so thankful for people that got involved with my family and helped me and helped my parents and help my relatives negotiate a new way of living and a new life. People that came alongside my dad, people that came alongside my grandfather and help them do things better. And that's what we do. We come alongside families, we come alongside these kids, we come alongside their parents, we come alongside their communities so that we can reintroduce these children back to their homes. That's always our main goal, when it's safe. If we can't do that, we go and we place them in transitional homes. If we can't put them in transitional homes, we place them in residential homes. But as soon as the children are rescued, what we do is we, we meet their needs physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And we care for them. And we embrace them. And we love them unconditionally. You know, I think the one thing that I've found in Destiny Rescue is this is that it is amazing what happens to a child's heart or a young woman's heart when you show them unconditional love. When you show them love with no strings attached, just to say, I'm here for you, I believe in you, and what is valuable to you is valuable to us, and we want to help you in whatever way we can. The response from these young women is absolutely unbelievable. And our caseworkers and our social workers and our doctors and the nurses and all the health professionals and all the people that work alongside them say it's absolutely phenomenal how these young people respond to safe environments, to love and to care, and to being around all the right people who are totally 100% committed to them having a better life. We understand that every child is unique at Destiny Rescue and so are her vulnerabilities. So we're absolutely committed to a unique freedom plans for them. We provide a safe place. We provide health needs. We provide temporary economic assistance. We provide education and vocational plans. We provide emotional health needs. All of them go through trauma counseling and trauma training so they can manage their emotions and so that they can go on and negotiate life well. Spiritual growth is always a part of our plan. We believe as an organization, we are called to be the Good Samaritans. We believe that we should share the gospel and we believe that we should provide safe communities for our children moving forward so that we leave behind the nation, the communities in different nations as better places. So now we start to educate, we work with elders, we work with other NGOs to ensure that when we identify a trafficking issue in a community, 
we're able to train and upskill and financially support that community so they can start up businesses, so that they can become educated, so desperation is no longer an issue in that community. I think it all points back to Isaiah 61. We have rescued, it says here 6,000, but I can tell you we've actually rescued over 8,000 children now in the last 10 years. We want to rescue 100,000 children by 2032, and we absolutely believe we can. As we start to come to the final part of my presentation today, I want to talk to you a little bit about my journey into this space. When I read a story in John 4, I read about Jesus sitting around a well with a woman that was like really, really lost and broken. And Jesus starts to engage in this conversation with this woman. And he begins to talk to her and she's like, how do you know who I am? Because he says to her, your husband, and speaks to her about the man that she's with. She says to him, how do you know about me? Because she said, I've been with, with six men, and the man and the man that I'm with is not even my husband. And this story has always echoed in my heart as a Christian and as a minister, because it is the longest conversation that Jesus ever had with a human. He was the Son of God. That's recorded in Scripture. So Jesus sits with this woman, and she is like, she is a Samaritan, so no one wants to know her. She's like, if you, she was, was at the bottom of a pile in her society and her culture. She was lonely. She was broken. She was in pain. She was destitute. She sits at this well and Jesus is there and he's having a conversation with her and She's not in any stable relationship. She knows what it's like probably to be used and abused, chewed up, spat out. And so did everyone else in the community know that because culturally, her arrival at that well at that time was unheard of. You don't go to a well in the middle of the, of the summer, in the middle of the heat at midday, ever. You go there in community. So the fact that she turned up at that time of day and the fact that she turned up alone was absolutely, just doesn't happen. Then she starts to talk to Jesus. Now, Jesus, I want you to know, in the scripture in John 4, he didn't get up and walk away. She was not in God's too hard basket. And I personally think everything Jesus did, he did because he wanted the world to see who he really was. He wanted us to understand that if Jesus was walking the face of the earth, where would he be found? Like, I, I don't know, but I don't know that he would be found in the places we think he'd be. Like, I don't know that he'd turn up in the cathedrals of the world. You know, I, can't, I think that he would value it and he'd appreciate it, but I don't know that that's where we'd find him. He'd go there to worship on a Sunday, I'm sure, but I think Monday to Saturday and Sunday afternoon, you'd probably find him sitting around a few wells like that, talking to people like that. And for me, it's like if it mattered to Jesus enough to talk to the broken woman of his time and the people that it, the woman that everyone else was turning away from and rejecting, the ones that didn't know real love or the ones that hadn't been valued or the ones that hadn't been treated right, if it was okay for Jesus right at the beginning of his ministry to do that, it's, it's right for me to be doing that as well. So this is the reason I believe the church, we need to at Bikers Club and churches all across this country and all across this world need to take the broken woman of the planet really seriously. And we need to take this seriously that women are being exploited all across the world and they've been on soul and they are being treated in ways that you and I can't even imagine. And I believe that Jesus wants us to sit around a few wells and start giving some woman a bit of hope, start giving some woman a little bit of dignity Start putting value back on women like Jesus did. Start putting some value back on women that have been sold and exploited and are broken and damaged, but to God they're not. And for me, this is why it matters. Because when Jesus left that woman, she was a different person. 
When Jesus left that woman, she had hope. When Jesus left her, she had dignity. When Jesus left her, he had promised her emotional strength, physical strength. He had given her spiritual hope and he had dignified her and given her the confidence to stand up on her own two feet and make a difference in the world around her. And this is what I see Destiny Rescue doing every day. Do you know, every day I pick up my phone and I have the joy, the absolute joy of hearing about young women who were in the darkest places on the planet having a well experience with Jesus. Having a well experience with people that love Jesus and who believe that they are called to set people free. And for me, it is a holy mandate and it is a calling that we all should embrace. We all should embrace. This morning, I want to ask you if you would please pray. First and foremost, there are over a million, a million that we know of, young women and children literally sitting in a well looking for some water, looking for some life, looking for somebody just to believe in them, looking for someone to dignify them, looking for someone just to believe in their dreams, looking for someone to create a plan for them so that they can set up their business so that they can become a hairdresser, so that they can help their family, so that they can go to nursing school, so that they can do what they want to do with their lives. I would ask you that you would pray for our rescue agents that are looking for people that are sitting at those wells. I would ask you, Bikers Church, would you pray for them? Some of you guys just so, I'm sure you understand exactly what I'm talking about. Would you pray for bravery for them? You guys will relate to this. I'm sure a lot of you in the room will relate to how you've got to be brave when you've got to get people out of bad places. Would you pray for discernment, for safety, for courage, and for endurance? And pray for their wives. Pray for their husbands. Pray for their children. Pray for those that have been rescued right now as we speak. I know that there will be kids that will be watched and they'll be being rescued and we'll be planning rescues for them. Would you pray for the Destiny, Destiny Rescue staff and for all our volunteers? Would you pray for all our pastoral care workers? Will you pray for our social workers, our psychologists, our nurses, our doctors from other NGOs that look after our girls? Will you pray for our supporters that they will stay passionate and connected to the cause that we have and that they will continue to support us to be able to offer life and hope to young women and young children across the world. I know it's been a really, really difficult topic. Life isn't easy for everybody. Life is a box of chocolates. And I'm, there's some people across the planet that are pulling some pretty bad chocolates out of the box. In my lifetime. I want to be someone that puts some good chocolate back in people's boxes again. And I want to be able to see and hear of young women that have hope again. And not just young women, friends. Sadly, we are rescuing more boys. I want to be able to put some hope back in people's hearts again. Thank you for listening to me. Hey guys, what an incredible morning with Rachel from Destiny Rescue. I hope that you've been blessed, inspired and encouraged. I look forward to seeing you again online here or you can make it in person first Sunday of every month up at our New South Wales Clubhouse 2268 Pacific Highway, Hellebray. We'd love to see you there. Uh, 10 a.m. service, 9.30 for coffee, first Sunday of every month. So until we see you next time, go to destinyrescue.org.au, check it out. Or check out some of our other YouTube videos or go on our website, longriders.com.au to find out more about Long Riders. Be blessed. See you again next time.